Good. Well, um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting of the Black Book Society. Uh, I can't properly say how good it is to see you all because I can't actually see any of you. Um, but uh, there are um, a considerable number of people attending, and I think some more will be joining soon. Um, and it's good to know that uh, this event has attracted uh, at, at that level of interest. The Black Book Society is so called uh, because the Black Books is the name traditionally given to the documents recording the minutes of decisions of the Council of Benches and some other organs of Lincoln's Inn. The series stretches back to 1422 uninterrupted and there are a few entries a bit before that. The Society exists in order to promote uh, events that have some bearing uh, on the history of the inn and its members and its possessions. There is no actual membership. Uh, by being at this event, you are taking a full part in the Society's activities, and whether or not you're a member of the inn, uh, we welcome you uh, as warmly as we can in the present circumstances. Just a few words of housekeeping. The event is set up as a Zoom webinar, um, so active contribution is limited to those who have been invited to speak and are registered as panellists. Uh, after the talk, however, there will be some time for questions. If you have a question which arises either during the, uh, during the cor course of the talk itself uh, or uh, afterwards, um, then please register that by typing into the Q&A box. Uh, you get that by moving your mouse uh, and when you move your mouse on the screen, you'll see that there's a series of icons at the bottom uh, and one of them is called Q&A and, uh, and you can uh, see the Q&As uh, um, uh, then and you can type in. Um, and then uh, when uh, the talk is finished, um, we will put uh, as many of the questions as there is time for uh, to the speaker. Richard Burden Haldane. Um, from the point of view of the inn, the history of Viscount Haldane can be uh, set out fairly briefly. He was called to the bar in 1879. He practiced at the Chancery Bar from Five New Square. QC 1890, he was one of the highest earning uh, members of the bar at the time, perhaps the highest. Uh, he was a bencher in 1893 and the various offices on the cursus led to his year as treasurer in 1919 just over a hundred years ago. Uh, as uh, Lord Chancellor, he presided in a number of the House of Lords decisions in company law that have had uh, a lasting uh, value, but he wasn't only a lawyer uh, and the period of his maturity, say from 1890 to 1925, I suppose, was a time when there were enormous changes uh, in politics, in the constitutional settlement, education uh, and society generally, uh, by no means all of them prompted by the war. And it may confidently be said that amongst the key figures of that generation of development, crisis and reform, uh, Haldane was outstanding. Yet uh, he has not been a household name. Uh, it's not immediately easy to say why not, uh, but whatever the reason, uh, tonight's speaker is making it his business to put that right. Uh, John Campbell OBE read economics at Sydney Sussex College, Sydney Sussex College Cambridge, and then joined N.M. Rothschild, uh, so beginning a career of almost 50 years in corporate finance and private equity. He was executive director of Noble Grossart and then with colleagues uh, founded the firm of Campbell Lutchens in 1988. His interest in Haldane dates back to his school days, as he'll tell you. His fascination with the man and his research into his life, his thought uh, and his work resulted last year uh, in the publication of his biography, Lord Haldane, The Forgotten Statesman Who Shaped Modern Britain. Of not many books can it be said, as it has been said of this one, uh, that they have had praise equally from The Morning Star and The Spectator uh, and uh, almost everything in between. It is John Campbell's mission to bring Haldane back to attention as one of the towering political and intellectual figures of his time. Tonight we shall have the privilege of seeing his enthusiasm for that task and hearing something about why it's worth doing. Mr John Campbell. 
Mama, and that is very, very kind. And it's a very great honor to join you this evening at Lincoln's Inn for, in a fashion, the whole span of Haldane's public life may be seen to have been bookended by your famous Inn of Court. So let me immediately introduce you and our um, other attendees to the great man, Richard Burton Haldane. Here he is behind me in this brooding portrait painted by George Fiddes Watt in 1910. He's in his fifth year as Secretary of State for War, swathed in a military coat with the braid of the Privy Council uh, uniform peeping out at the neck. He's 54 years old. It's the painting which, as I say in the preface to my book, I first saw at the age of 12 and um, hanging in the dining room when I visited Clone, which had been Haldane's home in Perthshire. That visit was with the start of an ever deeper involvement with the Haldane family and with the example of Lord Haldane, which for over 60 years has been the inspiration of my life. This eventually led to the 10 or so years of more detailed research and writing, which preceded publication of my book, as you say, last July. But in a way, Haldane needs no introduction to you at Lincoln's Inn, for the original of this portrait, commissioned by the council of your own inn at a cost of 250 guineas, now hangs in your council chamber. Yet I only came to discover that when uh, Mark, you Mark and your librarian Dunstan Spate engaged with me in relation to this task. But why do I want to share Haldane with you this evening and through the book to share him with the wider world? Very simple. Haldane in all of his endeavors as a statesman, a lawyer, a philosopher and an educationalist was the most brilliant thinker. But, and this was the key, he was also an equally brilliant practitioner. He's an example to anyone who aspires to the highest level of achievement in any walk of life, not just in public life or the law. His abilities were unsurpassed to think through, analyze, research, synthesize into a coherent whole any issue, and then incredibly to bring his conclusions into a concrete, practical reality. Having studied Haldane for many years, I'm wholly confident in proposing to you that there is no statesman in Britain of the modern age, say the last 150 years, with an equivalent reach and breadth of lifelong, consistently productive activity, both in times of peace and of war, for the public good. And that's why I've subtitled the book, The Forgotten Statesman Who Shaped Modern Britain. Indeed, I was delighted to see that the review of the book in the Law Society Gazette was titled with a question mark, Haldane, the 20th century's greatest British lawyer. That's an interesting question, which you can all judge better than me. I should be interested to hear your views as there are so many abstractions through which such a proposition would require to be brought into focus and to be judged. You can, by the way, find that review on the website at holding.com, which I've set up together with a range of other reviews and a collection of endorsements from people eminent in the varied fields associated with Haldane, who are kind enough to read the book either in advanced proof form or after publication. That's holding.com. One of those endorsements was generously provided by your own eminent colleague, Lord Newberger. Indeed, when I asked him a few days ago for his permission to quote from a private letter which he sent me relating to the book, he told me that he planned to be with us this evening. So let me take this opportunity to thank him again. His letter refers to another portrait of Haldane, this time by Sir Arthur Cope, which Sir Ernest Castle commissioned and which was donated to the Privy Council. And that now hangs in courtroom three at the Supreme Court. David wrote, Although I knew a lot about him, I didn't know the half of it. I wish that I'd appreciated quite what a remarkable man he was and what important contributions he made when he was overseeing me presiding in Privy Council hearings, which almost invariably take place in Court 3 of the Supreme Court particularly appropriate that he's there given his remarkable contribution to the Canadian Constitution. 
Haldane's presence there is doubly relevant, not just for Haldane's work in the Canadian Constitution, which we'll come to, but because it was Haldane who was the Liberal Lord Chancellor from 1912 to 1915, first called for the creation of the independent Supreme Court over which Lord Newberger presided. But that only happened in 2009, in parallel to the creation of the Ministry of Justice in 2007, and an independent Lord Speaker of the House of Lords in 2006, thus completing the separation of three of the potentially conflicting functions of the Lord Chancellor, which Haldane had recognised whilst in office. But it had taken nearly a hundred years for that to happen. Many of you lawyers here tonight will, of course, be very aware of Haldane's work within your own profession. I have to tell you that you're of rare breed, for I found that in discussion with numerous public and other figures in the other professions and disciplines that Haldane influenced, that, uh, that, that he's much, much more forgotten. It makes me profoundly sad and is something which my book sets out to remedy that amongst so many of today's leaders, members, alumni, beneficiaries of the other great institutions that Holding created or meaningfully developed, that there's so little recognition of what he did and more important, the relevance of Holding's thinking to today. I'm jumping ahead. Let's go back to Lincoln's Inn of 1880 uh, to 1881 and to the early bookend of Haldane's public life to which I referred. Here it was that after three years pupillage and at the age of 24, as a young and initially struggling first year barrister, that Haldane earned total fees of 31 pounds and 10 shillings, about 4,000 pounds in today's currency. The next year was only a little bit better, fees of 109 pounds, but by the third year they'd reached 160, that's about 20,000 pounds today. Then mercifully in his fourth year, 1883 to four, at the age of 27, the amounts begin to shoot up and he received 1100 pounds, 140,000 pounds today, and he was on his way. In 1889, as Marcus said, he became at the age of 33, um, the youngest QC appointed for 50 years. But in those early days, there were other dividends of a non-fee nature to be found at Lincoln's Inn. These were the seeds of the relationships and of the interests which were to be central to Haldane's life. He deviled for the celebrated Horace Davy QC, who went on to the House of Lords and to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the JCPC. This started Haldane on his constitutional law specialization. Davy had a formidable practice, earning, as Haldane put it himself, the astounding figure for those days of over £25,000 a year. That's about three and a quarter million. Twenty years later, at the end of 1905, when Haldane retired from the bar at the age of 49 to enter government, his earnings were too at that astounding level. As a self-made man who, who had borrowed on the reversionary interest in his late father's estate to fund his pupillage, and early years, those earnings enabled him in 1895 to enter political life as an MP and to devote the remainder of his life to the law and to wider public service, as well as to enjoy the pleasures of good wine and good food at the famous dinners over which he gets so much great work done. But for all of all the relationships that Haldane derived from Lincoln's Inn, perhaps the most enabling was the good fortune to sit next to H.H. H. Asquith at dinner in your inn in 1881. On that memorable evening, Haldane was 24 and Asquith was 28. Asquith was then in the fifth of a six year period of drought as a briefless barrister at Six Fig Tree Court. He could only make ends meet by writing regularly for the Spectator and also for The Economist, where he was paid a salary of 150 pounds a year, principally to write each week one of their two leading articles. Good training for a future chance for the Exchequer. It was only in 1883, two years after meeting Haldane, that at the age of 31, Asquith's legal career finally took off, when a friend became junior counsel for the Treasury and invited him to devil for him. 
Roy Jenkins, Asquith's biographer, summarized it well when he says that until Asquith was short of money, under, until then, as was short of money, underemployed and full of surplus intellectual energy. The Holden Asquith relationship was quick to blossom and was consolidated within months of their first meeting in 1881, when Holden, at the age of 25, was first disappointed in love, his advances being rejected by Agnes Kemp, the sister of the, his friend John Kemp, another Lincoln's Inn man. He suffered a form of nervous breakdown, was also brought low with rheumatic fever. But Asquith had married in 1877 his childhood sweetheart, Helen Melland. So Holden went to live and to recuperate with the Asquiths and their first two children, Raymond and Bev, at their home in Hampstead. There, their intimacy deepened. It was the start of a relationship which, for all of its vicissitudes, remained important to both men and was to play a vital role in the history of their age. Haldane became the brains behind the liberalism espoused by the triumvirate of Asquith, Gray and Haldane, and Asquith rightly described Haldane in the tremulous year of 1915 as the oldest personal and political friend that I have. Fast forward then to the later bookend of their association with Lincoln's Inn. Asquith and Haldane's lives are entering their last decade. No longer are they struggling barristers. Haldane by then, this is 1919, is elected treasurer of the inn, with his success as war minister becoming increasingly recognized. A war memorial was commissioned to commemorate those of Lincoln's Inn who'd fallen in the Great War. Asquith then succeeds Haldane as your treasurer, and in 1921, he returns to unveil the memorial. Both Haldane and Asquith had come a long way since those early days, 40 years before, when they first happened so to sit together in hall. So let me give you a fast reprise of Haldane's upbringing and achievements in order to give balance and context to a consideration of some of his philosophical thinking and legal work, on which I want particularly to focus this evening. He was born to a Scottish father and a Northumbrian mother in Edinburgh in 1856. Five years earlier, his father had bought the small property in the state at Clone, situated in Perthshire, about 40 miles as the crow flies, northwest of Edinburgh, with its glorious spirit-enhancing views along a 150-mile stretch of the Lower Grampians. That was where, above all other places, Haldane would go to to think, and what magnificent thinking he did there. His father, Robert, was a writer to the signet of no exceptional abilities, but with strong evangelical roots. And his mother, also deeply Christian, Mary Burton Haldane, was brought up in Newcastle and came from a formidable legal and intellectual family. Her grand uncle, John Scott, Earl of Eldon, was twice Lord Chancellor over a period of about 25 years, and his brother, William Scott, Baron Stowell, was a famous judge on the Admiralty bench. Her brother, Holday's mother's brother, um, who became Sir John Burton Sanderson, the first Wainfleet Professor of Physiology at Oxford and the creator of the Faculty of Medicine there, married the sister of Farrah Herschel, again of Lincoln's Inn, who also twice becomes Lord Chancellor. Holden records in his autobiography being taken by his nurse at about the age of six to see the House of Lords, then in recess. She persuaded the attendants there to let her place him on the wool sack and then exclaimed, the bairn will sit there someday as of right. So, as Holden later wrote, it was to the English bar that he was destined. He went to school at the Edinburgh Academy before moving on to Edinburgh University. At the conclusion of his first year, aged a mere 17, he spent a seminal term at the University of Göttingen in Germany. This triggered a passionate love for German philosophy, her literature, her organizational mind. Holding became a true European, open to the influence of other cultures, especially the German, and to a lesser extent and partly through his mother, his philosopher sister Elizabeth, who wrote a life of Descartes, and literary friends such as Edmund Gosse, the French. 
1885, at the age of 29, and financed by his legal success, the early interest that Holden had taken in politics, especially since April 1880, with the start of Gladstone's second five-year administration, led to his becoming the Liberal MP for Haddingtonshire in East Lothian. The next year, 1886, another election was called and Haldane introduces Asquith to the East Fife constituency, which he'd go on to represent for 32 years. Edward Gray, their mutual Northumbrian friend, had entered Parliament with Haldane in 1885. So here we are in 1886 with Haldane aged 30, Asquith 34 and Gray 24, embarking on their extraordinary and intimate partnership, politically and personally, which in the lead up to the war, with Asquith as Prime Minister, Haldane as Secretary of State for War and Gray as Foreign Secretary, was to have such worldwide implications. For in 1905, at the age of 49, Haldane entered government for the first time alongside Asquith and Gray in the administration of another Scot, Henry Campbell Bannerman. As War Minister, he retained that office two years later when Asquith formed his first administration, serving in all for a total of six years before being appointed Lord Chancellor in 1912. There, he served for three years until the formation of the coalition government in 1915, when quixotically and terribly he was thrown to the wolves by Asquith after being wildly and inaccurately accused by the virulent conservative press as being a German sympathizer. Roy Jenkins called this decision the most uncharacteristic fault of Asquith's whole career. His dismissal was one of the first and most terrible examples of the damage to a nation's interest that a misguided press can deliver when it whips up bigoted public opinion. For in a similar frenzy of xenophobia, which would result in the king being forced to change his name from saxe coburg gotha to Windsor, the Battenberg family to change their name to Mountbatten, a comment which Haldane had made that the classroom of Hermann Lertz in Göttingen was his spiritual home, was turned violently against him. Here was the member of the cabinet, most versed in German studies in the German mind, fluent in the language, the man who'd brilliantly restructured the British army in part upon the lines of the general staff of the German army, which had been allowed to study by the Kaiser as his guest in Berlin in 1906. The man who'd been sent to Berlin in 1912 by the cabinet on a secret peace mission to negotiate with the Kaiser, the Chancellor of Germany, Beth Holweg, and the head of the Navy, Admiral Tirpitz to seek to slow down the naval dreadnought building escalation excluded from the coalition cabinet. It was an incredibly shameful episode, recognised thankfully as such after the war. And of course, he did return as Lord Chancellor in Raymond in, in Ramsay MacDonald's first Labour government in 1924. But his work as a leading statesman in office nevertheless effectively ended abruptly in May 1915 just at the time when, as arguably the most able thinking man in government, he could have made a continuing formidable contribution, not just in the prosecution of the war, but perhaps, I believe more importantly, in the management or avoiding the mismanagement of the peace. But thank goodness, Holden by then succeed, um, succeeded after the calamity of the Boer War in his mission to make the British Army fit for purpose. The British Expeditionary Force, the old Contemptibles, which was his brainchild, was ready only weeks after the outbreak of war to take its place on the left wing of the French Army. It was deployed in time to play its crucial, valiant part in helping the French to slow the German advance and to turn the German army back from the gates of Paris at the Battle of the Marne. The territorial army which Holding created, plus his officers training corps, also greatly served the nation, whilst Kitchener's new army was brought into being. The Imperial General Staff, which he also created in 1909, ensured the coordinated mobilization of the support of the Empire. Haldane's success as War Minister Jack Seeley was not alone in saying that Haldane saved the state. And in saving Britain, he saved France too. 
At the conclusion of the Victory March in July 1919, of the troops of the Empire and the Allies, which Field Marshal Haig had led past the King on the saluting dais at Buckingham Palace, Haig, before going home to nurse his cold, went straight across the park to Queen Anne's Gate to pay his respects to Holiday. Shortly afterwards, he inscribed a copy of his published dispatches to Haldane with the words, the greatest secretary of state for war England has ever had. I should mention parenthesis that Haldane was also the founder of the Royal Flying Corps, created in 1912 on the advice of a committee which he chaired, and also in the wider security field that three years earlier, in 1909, another of the committees he chaired gave birth to the two branches of the Secret Service Bureau, now known as MI5 and MI6. So much for his military and security work. Let me now summarise his education work and will then come to philosophy and the law. Revealing that it was his educational work of which he was most proud. It extended over a period of 40 years. Its substantial fruits were first seen, excuse me, in 1895, when he worked jointly with the Webbs to establish the London School of Economics. It had started in the Aldwych with the diversion, utilizing Haldane's somewhat robust legal advice and opinion of part of the 10,000 pound Hutchison bequest to the trusteeship of the Webbs for the promotion of Fabianism. Seven years later, the first buildings of the LSE at Clare Market over in the southwest corner of Lincoln's End Fields were completed with funding substantially provided by Lord Rothschild at the behest of his friend Haldane. By then in 1898, Haldane's work had ensured the passing of the London University Act, which established London as a teaching rather than merely an examining body, and laid the foundations of Haldane's vision for London University as a great university at the heart of the greatest empire in the world. Later, between 1910 and 1913, he used to spend a further three years on the development of London University as chairman of a major royal commission into its structure. Around 150 days of actual hearings and deliberations, not taking into account the preliminary planning and all whilst he was either Minister of War or Lord Chancellor. In the meantime, Back in 1902, he brought about the catalytic changes of the Privy Council, which enabled the civic universities of England to be rolled out. This was of the greatest importance to England and to Britain. Scotland, of course, um, of, of course, had its four medieval foundations of Edinburgh, Glasgow, St Andrews and Aberdeen, but England herself at that time only had five universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Durham and London, alongside the more recent Victoria University, set up as late as 1880 with campuses in Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds. Haldane's changes, delivered by way of an appeal to the Privy Council on behalf of Liverpool, sprang those three institutions free as distinct entities from the Victoria University to become independent or what then became known civic universities. These were over time followed by Sheffield, Bristol, and then later Reading, Not Nottingham, Southampton, and Leicester, in all of which Haldane played a developmental role, each attached to their own city in a mutually supportive and beneficial arrangement. And then, still in England and back in London, in 1907, and after five years' intensive work, he gloriously brought into being one of his truly greatest achievements, his beloved Imperial College of Science and Technology, designed to be the equivalent of the Technische Hochschule he'd visited in Charlottenburg in Berlin in 1900 or 1901, that great scientific and technical institution. Scotland may not have needed his university structuring skills, but Ireland and later Wales did. Um, in 1898, in order to win the Irish MP's support for the London University Act, he agreed to the request of the Conservative government and of those Irish members to visit Ireland to develop the architecture of their modern um, university system. 
The plans he made were finally put in place in 1908 by Asquith's Liberal government, in which Haldane now served, and the new National University of Ireland was established that year with constituent colleges in Dublin, Galway and Cork, and the separate Queen's University of Belfast. And to complete the story of his educational work, after leaving office in 1915, for two years, he played a similar role for Wales, chairing a Royal Commission into the structure of its university system, which reported in 1918 and led to the creation of a federal Welsh university with constituent university colleges at Bangor, Aberystwyth and Cardiff. Please note that all of this educational work was fitted in around his daytime jobs as Secretary of State for War, Lord Chancellor, or a member of the Judicial Committee, which extended without break from 1905 until his death at the age of 72 in 1928. He never held any education office in government. Indeed, if you were to join me in a walk from Parliament Square, round behind the Supreme Court to Haldane's home, the 28 Queen Anne's Gate. We will find this blue plaque on its facade, the only memorial to Haldane in Britain today. You'll see that below his name and the dates 1856 to 1928 are the three words, statesman, lawyer and philosopher. I assume that educational pioneer was omitted for lack of space. Which brings us to philosophy and law. If Haldane, as I believe, saw his educational work as the greatest mission of his life, his belief in equality of opportunity through education as being at the heart of a civilized, socially responsible society, it was philosophy that was the greatest love of his life. This was the spiritual base which informed everything that he did and was foundational to his legal work. After studying under Professor Lertz at Göttingen, he came back to Edinburgh University completely inspired by philosophy's transcending powers. He went on to win all its philosophical prizes and also those of the combined universities of Scotland. He contributed to and edited alongside his distinguished brother, Professor J.S. Haldane, his first book on philosophy at the early age of 27. His constant pursuit of idealistic principles and his devotion to Hegel result in the invitation to deliver the prestigious Gifford Lectures at St Andrews in the two academic years of 1902 and 1903. Fourteen lectures published afterwards in book form comprised 580 pages, all prepared and delivered whilst at the peak of his legal practice and whilst a fully and indeed overactive liberal political thinker and MP. In 1904, the year before he finally enters government, he was actually offered the chair of moral philosophy at St Andrews. And he went on to deliver many papers and to write several more books on seriously philosophical matters. These included, given his intense interest in science, a book published in 1921 on relativity, which analyzed the philosophical implications of Einstein's work. He actually invited Einstein to come to Britain in that year to stay with him at Queen Anne's Gate, the first time Einstein had visited Britain. You might think that was quite a brave thing to do, to ask a German to Britain only two years after the end of the war, especially after Holden had been dumped for being allegedly pro-German. But Holden was always true to his principles and perhaps took a particular delight when introducing Einstein at his first lecture at King's College in saying that you're standing in the presence of the Newton of the 20th century, of a man who, was, who has affected a greater revolution in thought than that of Copernicus, Galileo and even Newton himself. And as one of the newspaper reporters wrote, one felt the slight shock in the air as Haldane, smiling, wary and implacable, drove the point home. 
Philosophical principles laid the foundation of the whole of Haldane's approach to life. Philosophy was an intellectual endeavor that radically shaped his political life, indeed every aspect of his life. We cannot understand his statesmanship or his legal work without it. Professor Fischer um, in Göttingen had lectured and written on the vocation of man. That book had a profound influence on Haldane. Haldane had found his mentor. In it, Fischer describes the vocation of the scholar as being the supreme supervision of the actual progress of the human race in general and the unceasing promotion of this progress. This involved an absolute dedication to the truth. As Fischer wrote, I'm a priest of truth. I'm in its pay, and thus I have committed myself to do, to risk, and to suffer for its sake. If I should be pursued and hated for the truth's sake, or if I should die in its service, what more would I have done than what I simply had to do? These ideas that each of us has a purpose in the world, and the scholars is one of the most vital spoke to and had a profound effect on Haldane. The idea that the philosophical task could be bound up with the very fate of humanity and history was revelatory. The idealism to which Haldane now aspired could spur a young man or woman with the hope that their actions could have world-changing consequences and assure them that there was a deep bond uniting all human beings. Hegel called this, uh, this geist or spirit. It could tell them something about the liberating effect of living in a responsible, as a responsible citizen within society. Haldane became immersed in the groundbreaking idealist thinkers of his day, especially James Hutchinson Sterling, Edward Caird, and T.H. Green. He was an early member of what came to be known as the British Idealists. For Haldane, philosophy harmonized all the many different viewpoints within the world. He believed that all individual views of the world simply represent what would be called a different category or degree within reality, which is determined by the purpose we have in mind when we engage with the world before us. It's the synthesis of these different abstractions which takes us nearer and nearer to the truth. To put this into the contemporary language of earlier this week, the abstraction of a television interviewee in California may truly be her truth, but it's the abstractions of all the other relevant parties brought into a whole that's most likely to move us nearer to a greater truth. Reality could not be reduced to one aspect. No person can claim an absolute knowledge of everything. The implication of this view for Haldane's statecraft and his legal work are significant. When faced with the difficulty, say, of the organization of the army, his style was always to consult others. It was important to be tolerant of others' conceptions of reality, and this applied both within and outside his own political party. His friendships with leading conservatives were key to his success as a statesman, as were his relations within the new Labour Party, which led him to accept the Lord Chancellorship for the second time in the first minority Labour government of 1924. Similarly, Haldane's political speeches are noted for their respect for his opponents. His disagreements with them tended to arise not because he saw a direct clash between his truth and his opponent's truth. Rather, Haldane usually considered the fault of his opponent's position to lie in his or her limited view of the whole host of factors that needs to be taken into account. It was not their position was simply wrong. That's a style of argumentation unfashionable today, given our penchant for polemics, but it's surely one from which we could all learn. And so you may feel at last, let's move to Haldane, his work in the law. From his early days, his legal work was always of the most cerebral kind. Ever realistic, he recognized in his early days at Lincoln's Inn that his comparatively weak voice would mean that he would not be playing to his true strength to enter branch of the law where advocacy scored highly. 
So he found himself particularly attracted to legal work where deep thinking, marshalling complicated arguments, profound preparation would be most valued. In agreeing to devil for Horace Davy, he chose to focus on cases argued before the supreme tribunals, the appeal court, the House of Lords, and of the great importance of all, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. I cannot this evening hope to do justice to the range of Haldane's legal work, and in any event, Haldane would always quote Goethe in saying that he that would achieve anything has to focus. Of course, Haldane's whole life was devoted to proving the opposite. So let me seek to focus just for a moment and to give you just a few flavours of his legal approach in the hope that that might encourage you to turn to the book for more. Alternatively, you may reach out to RFE Houston's Lives of the Lord Chancellors, 1885 to 1940, for an excellent four chapters on Haldane with a predominantly legal focus. We saw earlier that Haldane took silk at the age of 33, and then four years later at 37, he went special, meaning that he refused to appear in any court of first instance without an additional fee of 50 guineas on the brief, in addition to the normal fee. Thereafter, as Houston said, he was in the full tide of a busy chancery practice, and his reputation as a resourceful and successful advocate was firmly established. He concentrated on cases that were likely to be heard before the highest courts and on cases that required that deep analysis of principles and precedent. And if additionally, a philosophical principle could be brought into alignment with his interpretation of the law, all the better. Two of his most famous cases he lost. The first was in 1901, the Taft Vale case, where Holden had acted as legal counsel for the union which had gone on strike in protest against the Taft Vale Railway Company's treatment of a member of their staff. The case had gone to the House of Lords, where they ruled that trade unions could be liable for the damage caused by members acting in its name. This decision brought widespread outrage, but there is an advantage that in having a politician as your, as your counsel. Haldane worked with his Liberal colleagues to change the law, and on the appointment of the Liberal government, a new law reversed the decision, the Trade Disputes Act of 1906. This actually went further than Haldane would have wished, somewhat too far in favour of the unions. But nevertheless, Haldane desired that the rights of labour labourers should be fairly upheld and further that their working conditions should be made such that their daily tasks were no longer daily grinds. This was an indication of Haldane's desire to see a move from an older liberalism towards what he saw as a new, more socially responsible liberalism. And in his other famous lost case, that of the We Freeze in 1904, we again see the mixture of law and philosophy. Haldane viewed this case as probably the greatest litigation of its particular kind which ever occurred in our history. The issue concerned the union of the Free Church of Scotland with the United Presbyterian Church in 1900 to form the United Free Church of Scotland. It was a subject very close to Haldane's heart. Dissenting members of the Free Church claimed that the union of the two churches was invalid, in that a change in the doctrine of predestination arising from that union undermined the original constitution of the Free Church. The arguments are well beyond my pay grade. But Haldane, acting on behalf of the new United Free Church, chose to argue that the doctrine of predestination was not undermined by the doctrine of free will, and that it was now part of the new church's statement of belief. He gathered a mass of theological material, even marshalling the vast scriptural knowledge of his mother. Edmund Goss has penetratingly but irreverently described the day-to-day -day courtroom proceedings, and I commend them to you in my book. The Chancellor, Lord Holsbury, manifestly hostile to the Free Church's position, is read with effort, mental and physical, of finding holes in Haldane's polished armour. Lord James of Hereford, chafing under all the ecclesiastical metaphysic, 
constantly snapping out. I say without a reverence, but, or well, well, Mr. Haldane, but in the name of common sense. And Haldane, flapping back the side of his wig, replies, my Lord, we deal not with the dictates of common sense, but with a mystery. Lord Davy, for whom, as we've seen, Haldane used to devil, looking on with his parchment face, puckered up, searching for verbal solecisms, and Haldane, bland, tireless, imperturbable, never taken at a disadvantage, always courteous, always ready, pushes on in a faultless flow of language, turning the whole thing into a supplement of his two-volume book on the pathway to reality. Haldane and the United Free Church lost their case, and with it all of their property, and had to meet the costs of litigation personally. Haldane refused to let such an injustice stand. He immediately rallied the leader of the church, uh, the, the church principal, Rainey, and contributed an initial £1,000, that's £120,000 today, towards the money needed to redress the verdict. And then he moved up a further gear, deployed all of his personal contacts in seeking successfully an act of parliament to redress the situation. He immediately saw the Scottish Secretary, he saw the Archbishop of Canterbury, they were equally keen, and he went down to Hatfield to spend the weekend with A.J. Balfour, the Conservative Prime Minister, who agreed to allow a bill to be introduced to put the matter right, thus ensuring that Parliament could come to a practically unanimous decision to enact the bill. Whilst those two cases are typical examples of Haldane, the man and the lawyer in action, there are two other samples of Haldane's legal work that I'd like to comment, uh, to commend to you before we close. Haldane found the philosophical foundations of many of his beliefs in the, his, his interpretation of Hegel, whose thinking throughout his adult life guided Haldane's approach to the resolution of many problems. A wonderful exa example of this um, is and his consistent, there was his consistent deployment in many cases over many years, which can be seen in his work on the Canadian Constitution before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which I touched on earlier. Both as a practicing lawyer before that committee, and then later whilst Lord Chancellor in his judgments as the president of the court, Haldane was deeply concerned with the allocations of responsibility between the Dominion of Canada and its constituent provinces, which were originally set out in the British North America Act of 1867, the constitutional foundation of modern Canada. Believing as Haldane and Hegel did, that the strongest states are formed from the bottom up through, through the willing embrace or concession by each individual citizen of certain elements of responsibility to ever higher levels within the state. Subject to this, of course, creating a greater efficiency or coherence for all. Haldane was concerned that the act as drafted was of overly centralist in favor of the dominion in its division of powers. He worried that if as much as possible it could be efficiently done at the lower level in the provinces or at an even more local community level was not done, then this would reduce the willing support and commitment of the people in the provinces to the Union, to the Dominion of Canada, and thus make that Union fragile. As a result of this belief, in a series of philosophically as well as legally inspired judgments, which he made as president or member of the JCPC, which were bitterly opposed by the Canadian centralists of his time. He chose to reinterpret the 1867 constitution much more in favor of the provinces than the founding fathers were believed to have intended. He was abused by many for some of these judgments, both whilst he was alive and also after his death in the mid 1930s, when his judgments were considered by some to have stood in the way of Canada developing a style of New Deal to parallel that of Roosevelt below the 49th parallel. But in 1995, 
67 years after his death in 1928, the people of Quebec, despite all of the additional powers he delegated to them, were still chafing as to the excess degree of control they felt the Dominion exerted over their own affairs. A referendum was called on independence for Quebec, and by the narrowest of margins, 50.6% to 49.4%, Quebec chose just to remain in Canada. I believe that if Holden had delegated any lesser powers to the provinces, that the Quebecois would have been even more dissatisfied, and by the erosion of that fine margin, Quebec would have broken away from Canada. Holden's judgments, I posit posthumously, saved Canada from the loss of Quebec by his foresight in this adjusting of the power, uh, uh, the balance of power judiciously in favor of the provinces, in this devolution of power nearer to the people affected. There may be a message in there for Scotland. That I suggest in my book is the long-term reward which comes to the principal thinker, be he or she judge or statesman, from addressing the need, however unfashionable and underappreciated at the time, to think ahead and where appropriate to take the less popular road and to seek to reinforce weak, philosophically uncertain foundations. That's what a statesman rather than a politician is essentially about. And finally, I want to discuss perhaps the greatest speech which Haldane delivered in his life. His address to the meeting of the Combined Bar Association of Canada and the American Bar Association that took place at Montreal in September 1913. Holden had been invited to Montreal some six months earlier by a delegation comprising the then President of the United States, William Taft, the Prime Minister of Canada, Robert Borden, and the heads of the Supreme Courts of both the United States and of Canada. Some two and a half thousand members of the bar associations, including those four great men, met in joint conclave to mark the start of the centenary year of the 1814 signing of the Treaty of Ghent, which concluded the 1812 war between the United States and the peoples of Canada and Great Britain. It was a remarkable occasion. The king had to give special permission to his Lord Chancellor to leave the country and for the great seal to be placed in commission, thus releasing Haldane from his duties to make the transatlantic journey on the fastest ship of its time, the Lusitania. Pausing only briefly in New York for one night, he proceeded up the Hudson, the Hudson to West Point to review and address as a former war minister, the largest parade of cadets that had ever been mounted in the history of that academy. He then went on by special train to Montreal. Haldane took the preparation of his speech extremely seriously, working with the literary critic and right head and Goss in the preparation of it through six different drafts over a period of some three months. The speech laid down the foundations upon which can be established a true unison between sovereign states. He titled the speech Higher Nationality, a study in law and ethics, and you can find it on my holdane.com website. Haldane believed that the critical concept that goes to the making of such a foundation was embedded in the German word Sittlichkeit, Sittlichkeit, a word which has no easy translation into English, but may be defined as the system of habitual customary conduct, ethical rather than legal, which embraces all those obligations of the citizen, which is either considered bad form or not the thing to disregard. In Haldane's address, Sitlakite allies with the concept of the general will. The general will in Haldane's interpretation is the underlying will of the people, which Haldane believed lawyers and judges should seek to take into account where they could to reflect the gradual underlining changes, underlying changes taking place in society. Lawyers, he believed, are capable, in other words, of shaping laws that reflect the underlying movement of the general will. 
The general will is a very different construct from that of the popular will, which may be expressed erratically at times, for example, in certain elections. Haldane believed the common inheritance in traditions, in surroundings and ideals of the United States, Canada, and of Great Britain, created the base for much mutual understanding between those nations, and that therein a common transnational international cyclicite could be identified, which would function as a base for friendly and beneficent relations between those three countries, which in time could be an example to a wider group of nations. As always, Haldane turns this into an affair of the spirit. He doesn't ask in Montreal for treaties and written agreements. He's realistic enough to know that unison must be sought far deeper down in an intimate social life. Of course, he, uh, he was zealous in his determination to propose and enact legislation that would lead to improvements in the lives of his fellow citizens. The, la the letter of the law was still vital, but that letter meant nothing if it didn't rest on a wider, even more important foundation, the will of the people. What ultimately mattered was forming an educated, socially minded public opinion. That's the soil out of which beneficial legislation grows, whether domestically or in treaties between nations. You won't be surprised, therefore, to hear that in April 1915, only one month before he's thrown out of office, eight months after the start of the greatest conflict the world has ever seen, yet always looking forward, Haldane submits to the cabinet a prophetic memorandum. The document has led one commentator to hail Haldane as the conceptual godfather of the League of Nations and the strikingly accurate soothsayer of the impending interwar period. It was the first time the concept of the League idea was brought before the cabinet and Haldane's memorandum unveiled most of its essential features. The collective guarantee against aggression, a selected representative council to marshal information and mobilize opinion, a court to deal with related justiciable uh, disputes. He then goes on further to adumbrate the quest for disarmament, the declining importance of British sea power, the growing weight of American influence, the ruptures of France and Russia, and of course the rise of a yet more powerful revanchist um, Germany. Haldane was the first British statesman to lay the seeds of such an idea before the government. But I'm out of time. Perhaps in, in our discussion, we can look further at this and its potential relevance to our time, which I tried to address in the book. To appreciate this ubiquity is to realize that Haldane was more than just a great statesman. Haldane was a great man. There are fewer better um, reference points within the political constellation of the past than Haldane for helping us to elucidate and address the problems of the present. And as in Haldane's time, within that future role, the role of the legal mind intermingled with ethics and philosophy has a very great role to play. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Campbell. I'm sorry, uh, I'm fiddling with the buttons to turn myself on again. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm seeing uh, quite a number of questions coming through. Every single one uh, is saying how much they've enjoyed the presentation and how much it's told them uh, about a person who was strangely underappreciated. And perhaps I could start off by asking a question that's been put by Adam Riley, which is, why is he so underappreciated? What happened uh, after 1924-25 uh, or after his death? that meant that unlike so many people uh, of his generation, uh, he slipped into obscurity rather than being uh, famous like so many of his colleagues were. 
Well, that's a question that obviously I spent a lot of time thinking about over the years. In part, I think it's because if you're the man that works as a brain to bring so many wonderful things into action, that you're not concerned about being in the front line. You're not trying to um, be the equivalent of the leader in, uh, on, in social media, jumping up and down in front of the, uh, the, 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 the House of Commons. You're hard at work. And so in a way, he, I sometimes think it's rather like Keith Joseph with Margaret Thatcher. He was the brains behind it all and would work to um, deliver the policy, deliver the arguments, which could then be put into the hands of Asquith or Gray or others. But I think the, the other principal factor was this, that I think immediately after the war, um, the nation came to understand that what Haldane had actually done, they'd been deeply suspicious, as I say, of the fact he'd gone on this secret peace mission to Berlin in, that he talked so often and continues to talk about the influence of German thinking and philosophy and their practices and their science and their business. He was always seeing in Germany great examples to pull our socks up in Britain. And I think that they, that they realized a terrible injustice had been done, but you know, millions of people by then were dead. It was after the war. We're getting on with our lives again. There were much bigger things to deal with than rehabilitate whole Dane's reputation and so it was allowed just to gently come back and you know, by the time um, he, his death in 1928 the Times which had been one of his most vicious opponents says this was the, I think the words the equivalent of the greatest mind of any modern statesman um, but you know it just didn't really happen in the way that uh, I would have liked it to have done. Looking at that issue again, perhaps in, in just one detail, Tom Sharp has pointed out that the uh, that his resignation um, was one of the conditions of the Conservatives coming into government. And so, in a sense, Asquith couldn't have done anything else than get rid of him. But, I mean, did he have to overlay it or allow it to be overladen with, um, with, with uh, what was then, during the war, distinct prejudice? Um, <laughs> Well, I think again, I think done any different and should he have done it any different? I think this again is typical Haldane and um, that Haldane made it clear to Asquith that uh, when Asquith called for the, the resignation of all the members of the government and he was going to reallocate their places, many of them got the same job back, that Haldane was the first to say to Asquith you know, that you know, my, 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 my uh, seals are in your hands. But I think it has been generally accepted that Asquith rolled over too quickly. The Conservatives were being very insistent, but Asquith didn't stand against it in the way that many felt that he should. Gray felt that. Haldane went very, very quiet. He just went off rather relieved to get on with all kinds of other things. But the tragedy, as I said, was that you've lost the best mind in government, the man that could have prepared for the end of the war, that could have dealt with the, um, the, the, the post-war reconstruction, that could have thought of the terms of the Peace of Versailles, which was so tragically bad. And, and one little uh, thing you might, might interest you, that there are many other aspects of Holden we haven't had a chance to look at tonight, but from 1906 to 1928, for 22 years, he was president of the Royal Economic Society. And he had canes throughout the whole of that time as, the, uh, as either the secretary of the society or the editor of the economic journal, the journal of the society. So he was very, very interested in economics. And then, of course, hey, Keynes uh, comes out with his uh, consequences of the, of, 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 the, of the peace treaty and was very much against what was being done and foresaw, as I think Haldane was really concerned about, what the damage to Germany and to the peace of Europe was going to be from the terms of the peace treaty. So, you know, this was the awful thing. We lost such an able man. And if, Os if Asquith had held on, of course, Asquith... It, it was an element of self-preservation. He thought, I think, by removing the person who was most under attack, it would reduce the attacks on the government. On the contrary, it did exactly the opposite. It meant that Asquith became the main purpose, uh, focus of attack. And of course, Asquith goes um, 18 months later. Now, um, 
Moving on to a, a different topic, and it's one that uh, perhaps has been the subject of a certain amount of silence during the course of this evening. Um, what about women? Um, the period of uh, Haldane's uh, career was also uh, the period of the suffragettes uh, and then uh, women's suffrage. We know that he supported women's suffrage, but on the other hand, we also know that uh, after that one uh, attempt, not only did he never marry, uh, but I think it's right to say as... Um, uh, as uh, um, Philip Jones QC points out, that his uh, his ex fiance uh, wrote a novel um, in which he was to an extent lampooned. I mean, he 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 worked for equality of opportunity in education, and yet, of course, all his colleagues, all his close friends, uh, were men. And in his career, there isn't very much. Um, sign of the advancement of the women's cause. Um, what, what, what was his position on that and what did he do? Well, um, I'm happy to say that he did the right thing pretty well throughout. Um, but you're absolutely right, of course, that he doesn't marry, but he did fall in love with Agnes Kemp. She rejected him in, 19, in 1890. He again falls in love again with Val Munro Ferguson, the, 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 the um, sister of his friend Ronald Munro Ferguson, um, the, the Liberal MP, and the, she, they become engaged and suddenly she breaks off the engagement. And there was no reason given for it. She actually died only seven years later. Later, it subsequently come to light that she was probably lesbian and maybe she'd recognize this was going to lead to embarrassment and difficulty for Haldane. Nobody could ever get to get, uh, to, get to the bottom of it. Haldane went into a long-term cerebral relationship which has been one of the great uh, wonderful finds of the book that um, with a wonderful woman called Lady, Fran Lady Horner. Uh, her husband Sir Jack Horner um, lived at Mel in Somerset and the present Earl of Oxford and Asquith and um, fa his father and uh, just before the present Earl took over the Earl and I think it was about 2010-2011 um, had found on um, taking it over a paper bag in the piles of papers all over the place including where you'd find apparently in a, a paper bag you'd find a butcher's bill and a letter from Napoleon I'm not exaggerating in saying that there was a there was a bag that contained about 50 letters Letters from Haldane to Francis Horner of a deeply personal nature. There was never any uh, any physical side to the relationship that we can find any evidence for at all, but it was a very, very important relationship for Haldane, literally from 80, the 1890, 1891, 92, through to his death in 1928. Uh, the, the biggest request, bequest that he left outside the family and universities was to Francis Horner. So he was, the, women were very much part of his life. This formidable mother lives to 100, dies three years before um, Haldane dies in 1925, um, that his sister Elizabeth becomes one of the first members of the Companion of Honour in 1917. I think there were 17 members made. She was one of the four women. He lived with his sister throughout his life. She was a formidable philosopher and public servant in her own right. He was surrounded by women. He, as you write, to say, brought in three suffrage bills at the end of the 1880s, the beginning of the 1890s. He was always pro-suffragist, but he was not pro-suffragette. He didn't believe in breaking the law and breaking windows. Um, and that was why that, that he had to be, in part because of uh, being thrown out of office, but in part uh, earlier on, the suffragettes, his house was under police guard both before the war and during the war. Um, but you know, don't forget that in his machinery of government report, that utterly brilliant report on the structure of British government, the like of which has never been done, written since, that he, that he um, set up with uh, well, the Committee of Reconstruction, asked him to write this report with the, uh, with the commission of others. It, pub it was published in, nine, in 1918. It made very strong recommendations for women being advanced in the civil service. So women, it was very much something, the role of women was something very much that Dane believed in. Thank you. Now, Lord Justice Singh points out that um, there is still a body called the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. Uh, so that is 
one way in which his name is remembered, and it's almost the only way apart from your book that his name is commonly remembered. What do you think he would think of that as being the, 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 the peg to hang his name on? Well, I can't uh, comment on exactly what the society gets up to at the moment and, and the detail of their beliefs. But I think the important thing is that Holday recognized that in labor, there was the love of educating the people of Britain, which he felt was missing in the Liberal Party. And that was why increasingly in the early 1920s, he begins to move towards Labour. He never joined the Labour Party, but when the government was about to be formed and Ramsay MacDonald approached him, he saw the opportunity to bring to their table the um, work of a previous cabinet minister. There would have been, there was, yes, there was one other in the Lords who had actually been in the cabinet before but if it hadn't been for Holday and that one other, there would have been nobody with cabinet experience in the government. And he felt it was his duty to go in. He took on the chairman of the Committee of Imperial Defence, where all the planning was done between the Army, the Navy, and now obviously the Royal Air Force, and then the security services. That he, um, he, that he really engaged with Labour. He would have liked to have headed off the formation of the Labour Party by making making the Liberals much more attuned to the uh, alleviating the conditions of the working man and the working woman. So I think he'd probably be dryly amused to think that, that this is the society now he's most remembered by, and I hope they do some great work. I, I know that um, 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 that, that wonderful uh, Glaswegian um, Kennedy, I mean, Helena Kennedy is one of their vice presidents and I would love her to review the book um, for that society. As you say, it's been reviewed for the Workers Weekly or whatever it is. There's no reason why the Holiday Society of Socialist Lawyers shouldn't have their say as well. All right. Well, now, um, looking now briefly at um, the We Freeze case, um, Hector McQueen has pointed out that uh, 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 the late Lord Roger uh, regarded um, that as a textbook example of how not to do appellate advocacy on Haldane's part. So perhaps that's why he lost. But <laughs> meanwhile, um, what were his own religious views? Um, R.D. Turnbull asks that, and uh, it's a question that uh, had occurred to me as well. Yeah, I just quickly, uh, for Hector McQueen, I think you're absolutely right. I think that he just went so much overboard a subject which he knew everything that I just he completely bamboozled the bench and I think I'd, 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 I'd lost their support. Um, this is, this, sorry, the, the, the second part of the question was... What, what, were, what were Haldane's own religious views? Yes, his own religious, his own religious views were very, very interesting. He was brought up in his deeply religious Calvinist family, a Baptist family, and he was um, baptised by total immersion as a young man, I think about the age of 16. He did not believe, and you could say this was wrong, that he accepted baptism, but his parents were so religiously devout that he said, OK, he would go through with the baptism, subject to it being done just with the family that and subject to him being able to explain to the family why he was doing it out of respect for his parents' views and the belief that, as I said earlier, nobody has got the only view on something, that, he, that everybody has got an abstraction which all taken together can get to a greater inner truth. Holden didn't believe specifically in religion nor in any one religion, but he was a deeply religious and a deeply spiritual man. Of enough, the last article that he wrote for the Hibbert Journal in July 1928, he died in August 28, was a brilliant piece on the religions and the philosophy of the East and the West, comparing their religions and really saying how much he felt so comfortable with the thinking of the Hindu and the Buddhist religions. So he was always looking for um, all that was best in the, in the religious life, but for Haldane, God was in your breast. God was ever present every single day. That God was imminent within you. And if for some other beliefs, there's a transcendental moment that comes at the end of one's life, that's an added bonus in Haldane's view. For Haldane, God was imminent and was ever present day in, day out in his breast. Thank you. Well, I, I think we've got just one last question, which is this. Um, 
you, you've um, you've spoken of the uh, of the early meeting of Haldane and Asquith at dinner uh, as they sat next to each other in Lincoln's Inn, and um, I suppose that one of the things that you would like to have done was sat next to Haldane at dinner in Lincoln's Inn. I'm afraid we can't manage that, though. As we've said, we can show you the portrait, but. Would the rest of us have liked it? Was he, what was he like socially? Did he have a sense of humour? Yes. Um, it wasn't a jokey sense of humour. I don't think it was telling a joke, but it was deeply humorous, deeply interested, very interested in people. And that, um, that there's some wonderful stories. You must read the book to get some of them about you know, appearing in bathing suits down at Mel's and diving in to the water. And that, and that, that, that there was a very um, uh, personal side to Haldane. But if you want one uh, uh, ability to, uh, to, um, to, to demonstrate Haldane's quickness of thinking, I'll give you this one maybe just to end up on that he's one day in the lobby of the house of commons and he holding was always um, overweight mind you he had got diabetes he was in the portrait that you have on your website for the talk was the one painted in his last year by de laszlo when he was thin for the first time in his life but he was very energetic he could walk from london to brighton but holding that that, uh, that that was rather retired and Churchill comes up to him and prods this great corporation says what's in there holding and holding pauses for a moment and he says well he said all I can tell you is that if it's a boy I'm going to call it John if it's a girl I'm going to call her Mary but if it's pure wind I'm going to call it Winston and then, with that, with that, he then he kind of happily moves on. So he had got an ability to show humour, and um, there, there's, there, there's some good examples in the book. Thank you. Well, I should have said instead that that question uh, about whether he had a sense of humour came from another Campbell, Nicholas Campbell. Oh, brilliant! And um, with that, uh, I will hand over to the treasurer, if I may. Well. Um... Campbell, I should pause to say that Mark tells me you like to be called Campbell, uh, so I'm not rude, being huh? over, over familiar or, or rude. That yeah. was a uh, remarkable talk, if I may say so, about a truly remarkable man. Um, I, I knew very little about Haldane, except knowing that he was a great man, but I am, I, I feel exhausted actually. Um, about the range and depth of his activities. Uh, he was a major figure in the law, clearly a major figure in political life. Uh, his achievements as Secretary of State for War, clearly, absolutely remarkable, and a great uh, intellectual as well. Uh, he must have been a great intellectual in order to understand Hegel and Schopenhauer, uh, which I have, I must say, always struggled with. Though I will try and get hold of his translation of Schopenhauer, which I think was the first translation of one of Schopenhauer's main works. Um, he, uh, he had greater connections with Lincoln's Inn than I had um, realized. Um, he was one of, those, um, one of those band of Scotsmen who came south, uh, became members of Lincoln's Inn, and achieved greatness. One can think of John Murray, who became Lord Mansfield. You can think of Thomas Erskine, whose portrait is up there behind me, who became Lord Erskine, and indeed Haldane um, as well. Uh, the combination of his uh, legal and political career, I thought was interestingly illustrated. And this, I think, is, is something that uh, all of us uh, would like to have, but will never have, is the ability to reverse a defeat in the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords mm -hmm. uh, with an Act of Parliament. Uh, but that was, um, that was something that came to him as a result of this combination of extraordinary um, skills. Um, I feel very humble to think that I'm a successor uh, of Haldane. It will be, as Treasurer, it will be interesting, I think, to find out um, what Haldane did uh, as treasurer. I mean, did he, did he set to to reorganize Lincoln's Inn as he obviously set to, to organize much else? And that he was succeeded by Asquith. We have portraits of both, the portrait you have behind you of Haldane and Orpen's portrait of Asquith, both in the um, council chamber. Um, finally, um, I think what 
perhaps the one thing that struck me most is something that's already been mentioned, that Haldane and Asquith's um, great alliance had its origin uh, over dinner in the hall of Lincoln's Inn where they first met. And um, I, like many, regard uh, the ability of members of the inn to meet and enjoy each other's company over dinner or whatever in hall as absolutely central uh, to the life of the inn. Uh, and it is a, a great illustration of that. Uh, as Marcus said, of course, we, we at the moment are not able to uh, enjoy that. Um, and we should have uh, been entertaining you, Campbell, to dinner uh, in hall tonight. But once hall is open again, which I, I hope won't be too far away, uh, we look forward to welcoming you there. And as Mark said, showing you uh, the portrait. But in the meantime, on behalf of the inn and on behalf of all of us, may I thank you for a really uh, magnificent lecture. And I'd invite everyone to applaud, although I'm afraid you probably won't hear very much of the applause, but thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a privilege and I look forward enormously to that dinner to see your original of this portrait. Thank you so much. Good night. Uh, well, uh, just before everybody goes, I have a few final announcements, uh, which are about further events. Um, the Black Book Society programme is, uh, like so much else, in a state of flux. We shall continue to arrange small, medium and large meetings to the extent permitted by the state of the inns as state and its buildings, uh, and also to the extent permitted by the regulations. We're unmake, unwilling to make any firm plans until the future seems a little more certain. Um, but uh, as soon as there is a uh, scope for making relatively firm arrangements, we'll do that. Uh, please, as it were, watch this space. A number of people who joined this meeting tonight said that they would like to be told about future Black Book Society events. And so please watch out for them or look out for them on the Lincoln's Inn website. May I finally draw your attention to the next event being put on by the Inner Temple Historical Society. It's called Law in the Time of Plague. Was the law a good doctor? Plague and pandemic are not new, nor are the efforts of government to deal with them by executive proclamations. Professor Sir John Baker, the legal historian, and Professor John Wass, who's an endocrinologist, are going to discuss Tudor and Stuart governmental approaches, their legitimacy and effectiveness. Uh, and that is a webinar put on by the Inner Temple Historical Society on the 22nd of March, Monday the 22nd of March, at 6.30. And if you're interested in that, uh, it's a free event for which you need to register. You can do that uh, on the Inner Temple uh, website. Uh, with that, uh, I will simply say uh, again, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much, Campbell, for a fascinating, eye-opening, and uh, in many ways, very provocative talk, which I'm sure will lead a lot of us to think again about our heritage uh, and about uh, Haldane. And uh, I will say then, uh, good night.